Good afternoon or morning, everyone. My name is Terry Martin. I'm with National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation. From our team is also Charlotte Abel. She'll be keeping us on track time-wise and monitoring the Q&A window. And if time allows, we will select a few at the end to go through. Now, I'm really excited you've all joined us for our second topic in our prep tech talk series for the year, aligning and standardizing response map products to the community of lifelines. Some of the key objectives for today's session are to learn about the community lifelines construct overall and how it can be integrated into your existing agency's decision support tools and dashboards. Our second objective is to provide you with demonstrations of emerging best practices for aligning your agency's tools and apps to the community lifelines. And we hope you'll leave, with the, session, leave the session with knowledge and skills for how you can implement the con construct in your organization. We'll also share how resources like Highfield support the community life kinds construct, providing standardized national level data to fulfill static based data requirements. And lastly, throughout the session today, we'll share tools and resources to get you started or help you get further along following some experiences and lessons learned from our panelists. So why are standardized response map products important? One is the improved understanding of cross jurisdictional products and reporting. I can quickly understand maps and information products from partner agencies because we are all speaking the same language. Another is the improved understanding of impacts and cascading events. I can see where lifelines are unstable and identify infrastructure and other lifelines that can be impacted. Additionally, it can enhance coordination and reporting capabilities. I can share and report using the same construct, roll up to my state and region, and provide a shared view that can demonstrate the need for federal support. So here is our jam-packed agenda today. I will do a brief introduction on NAPSIC Foundation and some of our work supporting the community lifelines, followed by this group of amazing presenters, starting with an overview of the lifelines construct, and then we will give examples of work being done from the federal to the state level to help equip you with the skills and knowledge and resources we set out in our goals and objectives. I just want to remind you to complete the Mentimeter survey during this session. If you join late, the link was in the, uh, and the code is in the chat. And we'll be sharing the preliminary results after the introduction section, but we'll keep it open until the end. So for those who are new to our organization, I'd just like to briefly talk about who we are. National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We have a national network of over 20,000 members, both public safety and GIS practitioners alike, representing local, state, tribal, county levels. And our organization is governed by an independent board of directors that are primarily public safety practitioners with 30 plus years of experience in the field. And we were formed over 10 years ago and as an alliance between a number of prominent national associations, some of which you see here, and have evolved into a formal organization over the course of that time. And our vision as an organization is listed here, but at its core is to help build a nation of emergency responders and leaders equipped with the knowledge and skills in applying technology and data to change the outcome of survivors and really working toward building a more resilient nation. So as I mentioned, our reach is primarily national with about 20,000 members. Uh, you can see from the map here who's on the webinar today, at least those we were able to map based on zip code. And it's a pretty good cross section of across the country, a mix of disciplines, levels of government, and the private sector. Additionally, we have some international um, representation. And uh, so I apologize for anyone that's not on this map. I ran the the uh, mapping a couple days ago, and we've already received several more registrants. So I will add those to the final map that goes in with the materials up on our website. So what is our goal? Well, it's helping to get first responders, operators, and decision makers the right information at the right time. And how do we help to do that? Well, largely through defining and promulgating the consistent use of best practices. And we do this through the development of national guidelines and standards. We work to encourage and foster collaboration, and we do this through regional exercises and simulations. This also helps us to document challenges, what works well, and further validate and or update guidance based on those activities. Additionally, through education and training, like what we're doing today, we aim to build the capacity of the community, which is our mission. And finally, we work to transfer that knowledge and skills to the community. 
And we do this through you know, org to org, video and written tutorials, toolkits, and so on. So shown here are some of the resources that we provide to support the implementation of standards and best practices and to ultimately transfer that knowledge and those skills. And I would encourage you to visit the site. We're always publishing new tools and resources to support your missions. And I would just like to highlight one resource that we're pretty well known for is the Symbol Library. We all know that disasters do not respect geographical boundaries and require cross-discipline agencies jurisdictional support, and this environment requires us to speak the same language. That means NIMS positions, ICS organization, and decision support tools that are understood by your partners. In short, we've produced a suite of resources that assist in the standardization of symbols across public safety maps. Some of the resources are available, um, that are available or include the symbol um, guideline and symbol sets. These are sets of specific and discrete symbols that we have worked with the community to develop to meet specific symbol needs and to help achieve that symbol standardization when possible and feasible across all emergency response and management functions and across all disciplines from wildland to structural fire to search and rescue to law enforcement, mass care, and so on. So I won't go through this um, in detail, but I just wanted to give you a sense of how long this program has been underway, which is over a decade. To date, we have developed over 800 discrete symbols, and this effort has been largely successful due to our process of stakeholder feedback and engagement and the harmonization of already accepted symbol standards. So in addition, the program has been funded and supported through the DHS Geospatial Management Office and our collaboration with the Highfield Subcommittee, who supports the community by investing and managing Highfield Open, which is freely available national level infrastructure data as well as procuring and sharing licensed and secured data with the emergency management community. I highlight our more recent work, which has been focused on addressing infrastructure symbology data gaps. Understanding the importance of communicating information in a common language, Highfield adopted NAPSIG symbols for the default symbology for all Highfield hosted data layers. And for anyone not aware, a number of Highfield data layers have been nominated or accepted into Esri's Living Atlas, which is a highly curated collection of geographic information from around the globe. It includes maps and apps and data layers to support your work. And this makes this infrastructure data even easier to discover and consume in your own maps and apps. And lastly, we worked with the Lifelines Group, which is where Jessica, our very first guest presenter, is on. Um, is to get our use our stakeholder feedback process for recommendations for updates to the community lifeline icons, which Jessica is going to be giving us a background on in just a moment. Um, but before I turn it over to Jessica, I thought I would just check the results of our Minty meter and see how that's coming along. All right, so we have a pretty good mix of uh, organizational representation, lots of local and federal government, mix of state as well. How familiar are with the community lifelines? And this is not at all a surprise. We figured a, a good bunch of you were somewhat familiar. Um, so we're excited that we'll be able to give you some more context. And have used the community lifelines as a part of reporting. So not many, but we hope to change that after this session. So thank you all for contributing to the Mentimeter. We'll keep this open during this session and review back at the end if we have time. So I'm very excited to have Jessica from the Office of Policy and Performance Response Directorate speak on the Community Lifeline contract. This may be a new or somewhat vague concept to a large portion of our attendees today, which is, this appears to be the case. So before we get into how to standardize decision support tools that align with the community lifelines construct, she has generously offered to get us all acquainted with the lifelines and give us some background on this move and what it means to community supporting uh, disaster response. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Jessica. Thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction and thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, during today's session, I will cover um, define what the Community Lifeline Construct is and explain FEMA's plan to institutionalize the Lifeline Construct. I will explain why uh, FEMA decided to implement the Community Lifeline Construct and provide an overview of what the Lifeline Construct is. Um, time permitting, I can go into stabilization and answer any questions that arise. I would like to um, highlight the Lifelines at FEMA.DHS.gov action box 
This goes to our Lifelines team. So if you have any questions that we don't cover today, uh, or if you think about it after this uh, meeting, please feel free to send in any recommendations or any questions to that inbox. The first thing I want to cover is what the Community Lifeline contract is. In short, there are seven community lifelines that represent the basic services and functions that communities rely on to support the basic needs of the population. These are organic to a community. If any one of these lifelines are unavailable to a community or disrupted, there will likely be persistent threats to life and property as a result. Due to their importance to all aspects of a community, reestablishing these basic lifeline services is the primary focus during response. So it's very important to note that the lifeline contract is not introducing new areas of focus for emergency management. Emergency managers have always prioritized these things during response. The community lifelines contract provides uh, a framework that helps assess and understand the impacts of an incident and help identify and prioritize required response actions across the federal, state, local, tribal, and private sectors. FEMA's plan to institutionalize this across the board. Uh, we're taking a three-pronged approach. One is focusing in on the national level policy, which is the national response framework. The national response frameworks includes all of the principles and guide uh, definitions of lifelines and what it intends to do for incident response. Uh, we also have the incident stabilization guide, which articulates how FEMA utilizes the lifelines during response operations. The guide will be in operational draft for 2019, allowing FEMA personnel to utilize the guide and capture any gaps and provide feedback before finalizing for 2020. Uh, lastly, we have Lifelines Toolkit 2.0. We have already released Toolkit 1.0 um, that's open for the whole community. We received excellent feedback and with all the feedback and use of real world activity and exercises, we are revising it and sending it out to the whole community again in August between mid and uh, late August. So now I would like to go into why. Why did FEMA decide to implement the Community Lifeline Construct? The Community Lifeline Construct helps to minimize the complexity of emergency management as it enhances the ability to gain, maintain, and communicate situational awareness for the whole community during disaster response. The contract keeps focus on the most critical services to protect human life and property. Lifeline management also encourages the whole community response by overcoming boundaries between government, non-governmental organizations, and the private sector, including infrastructure owners and operators. This operational coordination translates into efficient approach approaches to incident stabilization and the transition to recovery. So in short, the community lifeline contract helps decision makers to prioritize, sequence, and focus response efforts towards maintaining or restoring the most critical services and infrastructure. It helps decision makers to understand the interdependencies across the various lifelines, identify the root cause of particular impacts, um, and facilitate the ease of communication. As mentioned earlier, this is an excellent lexicon to communicate across every echelon. Sorry. Um, lastly, I'd like to give a Lifeline overview. So this is one of our products that is also available. It has our most up-to-date content. This gives a definition of the Community Lifelines construct. It identifies the purpose. So you want to be able to identify the root cause analysis, interdependencies, prioritization, and ease of communication. One of the biggest components of the Lifeline contract is the assessment. It's really changing emergency management as opposed to just going and collecting data. You're collecting data to really understand what the status is, why that's important, the actions that are being taken, and identifying any of those limiting factors. Um, overall, this is all driving towards stabilization. So what, so what, now what, and without what? The assessment helps to identify what actions are being done, what actions need to be taken in order to drive towards stabilization. Uh, one area of discussion that has been very passionate across the board between our state counterparts, our regions, is stabilization. And stabilization occurs for response. Uh, we consider this more of a triage approach. If we have a, an impacted lifeline that is 
Anticipated resource and manage. Something is going on with the water sector. Our population doesn't have water, but we have a mission in place to send water to them that will satiate their needs. That is considered stable for response because there's no outstanding need. There's no threat to life, property, um, and that there is a sustainment factor there. So the Lifeline Toolkit will provide various tools and templates to help guide all of our emergency managers to include uh, reporting documents. And one of the biggest pieces are our planning lines of effort, which help drive towards civilization, utilizing milestones and objective-based response. So at this time, I would like to take any questions, if there are any. Thank you so much, Jessica. I think um, we are running right on time. So we will uh, ask folks to put in their questions in the Q&A, and Charles is going to monitor those. And I believe you should also be able to see them so we can hopefully address them at the end. But I think it was really helpful to not only hear what the community lifelines construct is, but why we're moving in that direction. I love that there has been some passion discussion on stabilization and that mission partners have been able to utilize the community lifelines construct over the last year and test it and give some valuable feedback for 2.0, which you said would be released in mid-August to late August. So uh, folks should definitely keep an eye out on that. And I know Charlotte has been adding links in, so I believe she put a link in for where you could get the tool, the current toolkit resources. Um, and then, so thank you very much, Jessica. I think um, I'm going to move forward. So you actually hit on a number of reasons and goals for moving to organizing and reporting by lifelines. And there are a number of reporting and decision support tools that decision makers consult in determining, in determining the scope and complexity of a disaster and identifying priorities for stabilization. And these can be SIT reports, daily briefings, incident action plans, situational awareness apps, just to name a few. And information specialists and geospatial analysts that support the curation and delivery of incident data to first responders and decision makers are looking for how they can not only align their apps and tools, but also to identify data sources that can support the questions that decision makers are asking, such as what is the status of the water or transportation um, lifeline? What underlying components are the cause of transportation being unstable and what are the priorities? So our next two presenters are actually working at the federal level to do that very thing. I'm not going to steal their thunder, but I'm going to go ahead and turn it over first to Sid, who is contract support to FEMA and has been focused on this effort for at least a, a, over a year through the modeling and data working group, which he chairs. So thank you, Sid, for joining us. I'll turn it over to you. Sure. Um, th thanks so much, Terry and, and Absig, for, for the opportunity. And thank you, everyone, for taking some time to, to, to listen. Um, I'm really excited to share what uh, this modeling and data working group has, has been doing. Um, to support the lifeline construct. So uh, what is the MDWG? Uh, we're an interagency working group which was appointed by the uh, emergency support functions uh, leader, leadership group or the SFLAG to basically identify any authoritative models and data sets that can be used to enable response planning and operational decision making uh, for catastrophic events. Um, and so we, we have a, a couple goals, um, but to, to highlight on just two of them, We've been working, uh, as Terry mentioned, um, very closely with the Lifeline team um, and, and others involved in, in uh, the Lifeline construct to identify, um, you know, data sets and, and, and tools that can be used um, and fill any gaps in our data inventory that can be um, helpful with reporting information by each Lifeline. And then uh, we're, we're working with the emergency management community to improve and encourage disaster information reporting um, and, and help them with aligning their data products um, and the way they report information by the lifeline construct. And so we've been doing that through a variety of, of uh, means. Um, the, I think the most important one is, is our, our monthly meeting. So we, we have a, a meeting on the third Wednesday of every month to discuss one of the uh, one of the seven lifelines. So as you can see in the bottom, we've got a schedule here. Um, and so we, we've been working with our mission partners to understand what, what information they, they have or what information they're, they're looking for that, that we can then um, help them find to support uh, their emergency response operations. 
So this, this all started with a spreadsheet. Um, when the lifeline construct came out, um, we basically curated all of the lifelines, their components and their subcomponents, and we started a spreadsheet to capture any available data sets that we were aware of that might address the needs of one of these subcomponents. Um, now, through our continued conversations with, with our mission partners, we realized that it's, it's pretty rare that one data set is going to cover all the information that an emergency manager might need to address one of these particular subcomponents. So we've been working to, to find all, uh, any and all available data sets that, that we can start to either combine or pull attributes from um, to, to be able to answer these questions. So we started adding information into our spreadsheet um, so that we could start to build a, a schema um, that, that we could then report out to folks. And so uh, a great example is a conversation some folks in the working group had with the FCC recently. They have um, a disaster information reporting system, or, or DERS, which is where the, um, they're able to report out information using a standard that they have. Um, but we were able to go to them and, and provide them with a schema that, um, that, that we needed, and they, were, they happily you know, supported us and were able to provide us information um, in, in a way that allowed us to report uh, impacts to the communications lifeline uh, by the lifeline construct. Uh, and and then um, you just heard about it earlier, these indicators of stability, right? So we've been working with our mission partners to understand, you know, what, what are the indicators that uh, someone that may be making a, a decision on, on how we respond to an event, um, what are the kind of things that, that would tell them when they might need to ramp up or dial back their response efforts, right? So if we take this example, land mobile radio networks, so we can say that maybe if 75% or more of the uh, service is down, that we need to all hands need to be on deck. We we gotta we gotta put as many resources as we can, as we can to to support um, the process to stabilize that particular uh, that particular lifeline. Um, and then as we start to recover, and we notice that maybe we're down to 25% or less of an outage, that we can start to dial back and maybe shift those resources to another. Uh, another lifeline that might be impacted. Um, so we're, we're trying to we're trying to understand what these indicators are, so we can report that out um, to the folks that are creating this data, so that we can then um, we can then use it for reporting purposes. And so we've been trying to take this information, and and there, there's a uh, there's a team at FEMA right now working on creating lifeline dashboards. Um, and and basically the the purpose would be to uh, combined static and real-time geospatial data to display impacts to the community lifelines uh, based on based on the lifeline construct and 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 give um, provide that situational awareness to the decision makers involved. And actually, this was recently piloted during this year's national level exercise called Shake and Fury, which you'll hear uh, more about uh, in a later presentation today. But um, basically, it was an opportunity for for the folks involved in that in that exercise to simulate how they would respond to a significant earthquake um, and, and how they would report information out by, by each of these lifelines. And so using these dashboards, we found that we were really able to, um, uh, the, the decision makers in the room were really able to get a good sense of the situation um, and, and understand the impact. But some feedback we received was that um, they didn't address response priorities as well as they probably could have. Um, so, for example, if you take this uh, this cell tower um, dashboard on the bottom right here, you can see where all, where the cell tower outages are. But what other information um, can we include in there that might make it easier for a decision maker to understand which one of those cell towers is a high is the highest priority to get back online, right? So we're trying to work with our mission partners to understand what are those other requirements that they need to know, and then we can then um, you know help provide that standard. And so just to close, I just want to talk about our path forward. So we were working um, with the, the working group to identify and determine where the interdependencies are and cascading impacts or failures of critical infrastructure um, and, and how they impact the lifelines so that we can help better determine response priorities. And so we're doing that through um, uh, a couple ways, and one of them being kind of a reform, reformatting of the spreadsheet that uh, I mentioned earlier, and also our, our approach to soliciting feedback from the emergency management community. I mean, we're looking for three things primarily. So we're looking for static data sets. Um, so think high field, right? Where are the roads, hospitals, 
um, power plants, things like that, that can be used to model what potential impact could look like. Um, and to then couple that with live data sets, um, and you'll hear more about that in the following presentation, so think crowdsourcing, right? So um, get, getting authoritative information from our crowdsourcing community um, or folks like Waze and GasBuddy to, to get real-time impact or, or status information like road closures or the status of a hospital um, and th things of that nature. Um, and then in addition to all of that, we're, we're trying to capture through our meetings any other necessary data attributes um, or requirements for, uh, for reporting that can be used to build a standardized schema um, and metrics uh, that, that the emergency management community can use as they're reporting information out and, and using the lifeline construct to, to kind of have that, uh, that uh, same language when we're all talking about how we respond to a natural disaster. Um, so I know that was a, a lot of information um, to throw uh, all at once. So if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me at, at either of these uh, email addresses. And uh, if you'd like to be a part of our uh, modeling and data working group meetings uh, moving forward, thank you for your time. Awesome. Thank you, Sid. I have actually been a part of the modeling and data working group monthly calls whenever I can. And I always learn a lot about available resources and initiatives and take away some really good lessons. So I would highly encourage folks to get on your list and attend whenever you can. And I appreciate how you shared your lessons learned and mentioned the successes you've had identifying data owners who just needed to know what information was needed and in what format. And I know this is an ongoing effort to fill those gaps, and um, which is why we are grateful to have Emily present next on the work of the crowdsourcing unit. So Emily, thank you for joining us. I'll let you take it away and share uh, some of your really interesting work that you guys are all doing. Awesome, thank you for having us. Um, like uh, Sid mentioned, I work here at FEMA as well and I run our crowdsourcing coordination unit. So I'm gonna talk briefly about some of the work we've done. I just, let's see if I've got control of the screen. Yes, I do. So I just wanna start by giving everyone a little background on what crowdsourcing is. Um, and to us here at FEMA, crowdsourcing is really a participatory approach that we use to gather ideas or content or services that we solicit from a large group of people. And everyone is probably familiar with other forms of crowdsourcing out there, Waze, for example, Airbnb, if you've ever used Yelp to figure out what restaurant you're absolutely not going to go to. Um, as well, the government has got in on crowdsourcing, and we have a site called challenge.gov where we'll put up uh, problems that we would like the crowd to tackle. So FEMA's gotten into this game and we're using crowdsourcing to paint a better picture for situational awareness. Uh, this starts at what, by understanding where does crowdsource data come from. And the first thing that usually pops in everybody's brains is social media. And that is true, that's one major source of crowdsourced information. But we also get data from the Internet of Things, think of all of our connected cars and refrigerators and all those things, first person accounts, uh, open source websites and the Internet in general, traditional news and media, and a lot of the crowd is tapping into imagery and remote sensing. So the crowd is able to access anything really that is open source. At FEMA, we're using uh, a spectrum of crowdsourcing from passive to active. So our passive crowdsourcing, we usually t think of our companies that are out there, our tech sector companies that are collecting data that we can then repurpose in other ways. Uh, one might be Google and their busyness data or Facebook or Twitter. Um, then we have Waze and GasBuddy that users can kind of contribute to that platform and it's a, another crowdsourcing platform. And so we work with all these groups, but we also work with really active crowdsourcing groups that we call our digital volunteer groups. You'll see a lot of them here on the right side, Code for America, uh, CEDAR, Standby Task Force. All of these uh, skilled, highly trained volunteers uh, curate products using crowdsource data to create a situational awareness tools. And I'll give some examples of those next. Get to the next slide. A little delay here. So one thing that I usually talk about with everyone is, you know, our typical fears about crowdsourcing and social media. And one is that, you know, we can't trust it. And really crowdsourced data is very high quality, it's very timely and accurate. 
um, you're soliciting this information from a large group of people and there is a data validation process and often a photo that goes along with whatever you're looking at. So we really trust the crowdsource data and it's been proven time and time again to give us uh, really high quality, uh, timely information. The other thing is crowdsourcing is more than just social media listening or monitoring. With crowdsourcing, we're actively engaging in a two-way conversation uh, to build out, refine, and develop different products. When I think about crowdsourcing and emergency management, I think about, you know, what do we need in a disaster? And really, when it comes to knowing what's happening in a disaster, we really just want to be able to Google it, right? So with crowdsourcing, we want accurate and timely situational awareness. They're a force multiplier for our already tapped out EOC staff. And it gives us a way to engage citizens in productive tasks. Um, people are out there, they want to help, uh, they want to be part of the response, and crowdsourcing is a way to tap into that energy in a way that's part of the solution, not kind of adding to the problem of the disaster. So to help emergency managers uh, kind of develop their crowdsourcing capability um, within their agency, um, we partnered with um, the City of Nashville, New Hampshire, and we set up the crowdsourcing toolkit for emergency management. And so the website's down at the bottom there, crowdsourceem.org. This is the front page, and it really walks you through the different uh, steps and tools that are out there that you can use to integrate crowdsourcing into your emergency management agency. When the, we talk to different groups about how they want to integrate it, you know, the first thing we have to think about is what is your methodology for data collection? SID and the Modeling Data Working Group have done a lot of work on this. NAPSIG has a lot of great tools on a methodology for data collection. Um, but we want to have a strong validation process. We want to be transparent that, you know, the data we're collecting is crowdsourcing data. We want to use the standards that the modeling and data working group are coming out with as far as the attributes and labeling of everything. And when possible, we find it really informative to put the crowdsource products right next to um, the uh, more uh, traditional sets of data. So NAPSIG produced this great search and rescue map uh, last year during the hurricanes that displayed side by side the different types of crowdsource rescues that were going along, along with the uh, urban search and rescue rescues, which gave a really uh, full picture of what was going on in the disaster. So Sid mentioned uh, our different dashboards that we're creating by Lifeline, and I just wanted to highlight two of them, one being uh, the transportation dashboard, which is pulling in uh, live Waze traffic data. Uh, we have a partnership with Waze through their Connected Citizens program, which all government agencies can sign up for and ingest uh, their local Waze traffic data. And then we also have Gas Buddy um, pulling in uh, the status of the different uh, uh, gas stations. So these are two examples of kind of us using the crowdsource data in a way to inform our uh, dashboards and uh, when there's not a live feed, we look to our partner groups, Code for America and CEDAR being one of them, to produce these products. So on the left, you'll see for uh, Hurricane Michael, the uh, location of points of distribution and Salvation Army feeding sites. And on the right, you'll see a map of the different shelters. And, the, you know, this takes a lot of active work. They're curating this information uh, from the different state websites, from Twitter, um, social media in general, and when you click on any of these dots, it'll tell you the source of where that information came from. And these are live feeds that continually are updated and are public facing. So the survivor can access this, and us here at FEMA, we can also access this map here. So to build out what the Modeling and Data Working Group is doing, we're looking at where are there gaps in uh, information and data sets, and how can the crowd fill in by building products just like these. This uh, year for our, our first activation this year was for Hurricane Barry. And so what we'll do each activation of the National Response Coordination Center is we'll set up a map journal uh, that kind of curates all the different crowdsourcing products that are out there. You'll see uh, the first product that's highlighted is um, the NAPSIG Hurricane Crowdsourced Photo Map, uh, which is a great tool um, and displays um, actively displays different photos, damaged photos that uh, have now been coded by Lifeline. So this is kind of a curated tool that we use to demonstrate, you know, all the different crowdsourcing resources that are available by Lifeline. 
And just to give a local example of how crowdsourcing can be integrated into an emergency management agency, um, this is uh, Nashville, New Hampshire, where I used to work. And so we used uh, Survey123 uh, to do a rapid damage assessment after uh, like a severe winter storm. We put a public-facing Survey123 uh, on our website that we posted then on Facebook and citizens contributed their photos. And then we also gave our CERT team the Survey123 mobile app. And so the photo on the top left is what I was seeing in the EOC come in real time as my SIR team and citizens were contributing to this crowdsourced damage assessment map. So we have a lot of great examples of crowdsourcing happening at the local level, and this is a great way that we were able to engage uh, the citizens in Nashua in doing a really rapid damage assessment. So if you're looking to do crowdsourcing, um, we really encourage you to use uh, the toolkit and kind of follow that uh, crawl, walk, run um, methodology. And so look to use first the, pre, uh, the free private sector tools like uh, the Ways Connected Citizens Program. If you're interested in partnering with some of the digital volunteer networks, we can help you connect with that. And then some um, advanced emergency management agencies are standing up their own crowdsourcing teams, which are uh, referred to as virtual operations support teams. And there's great examples of organizations uh, like the Oregon Emergency Management Agency that has their own team. Um, so that's it for me. And I really uh, thank you for everybody joining the call and um, happy to you know, email us if you have any questions. Um, we're still developing this capability here at FEMA. So um, we're looking forward to partnering with other folks on this. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Emily. I love that you uh, had citizens share their photos during emergency via a public-facing survey one, two, three form. That's awesome. Um, and throughout the session today, uh, we're identifying some really great resources for the community that is uh, represented in the audience today. And I want to highly encourage you to check out the Crowdsource EM toolkit that Emily talked about. It can really shorten your agency's learning curve and give you some strategic guidance. And one particularly relevant section is on crowdsourced data, building a data framework using existing standards, considerations for essential elements of information, and organizing by lifelines. I feel like I could probably mention at least a half dozen other relevant information resources within that toolkit alone. But uh, instead, I'll just encourage you to check out um, that site. I know we've put it in the chat. And I've per personally witnessed as a result of the work that this group has done uh, in support of disasters. Um, and this brings me to uh, the story map journal that Emily, you mentioned, and how your team hosts these daily crowdsourcing coordination calls during significant disasters or when you are called upon to provide support to your format for capturing relevant information for mission partners to reference, whether they can make the calls or not has proven really valuable. This is done by other groups like the ESF-9 Search and Rescue Group and by the folks at FEMA who lead the interagency geospatial coordination calls, which is the example I'm showing here. In fact, this journal points to yours, Emily, so all relevant disaster information can be uh, in one place. And I wanted to note that they've also achieved some significant efficiencies by reporting out by community lifeline during these calls. So for example, relevant impacts and actions uh, for the safety and security lifeline are summarized here. And if there's nothing to report, they just move on. Um, in fact, another method for sharing situational awareness was produced by Region 6 during Hurricane Barry. And actually, we have Erica Siggins with us today. We, we noticed that the information her group was putting out during Barry through the Hurricane Journal, and it followed a similar organizational structure. And Erica, definitely pipe up if I misspeak, but um, your incident journals are organized by the acronym TIP, which stands for Threat, Impact, and Posture. So the home page uh, or web map shows the weather or hazard data, and the lifeline section or ESF depicts the impacts, and then the regional posture of teams and facilities is at the end. And so for jurisdictions that have been successfully working by ESF, I thought what you did here was a great way to show their connection. And I also like how you developed an edit layer of the component icons that go with each lifeline, which is what is shown at the bottom left of your screen. And you, can, you guys follow the stoplight approach, giving each component icon a gray, red, yellow, or green halo. 
And what else is cool here is that whenever one of those icons on the, is added on a map, then the boxes at the bottom will count them. And on the uh, right-hand side, the number reflects the total. Um, the screenshot on the lower right is the pop-up of the components and uh, EEIs or subcomponents page of the Lifeline Response Toolkit. So I really like how you put in reference materials for anybody who might be new to the Lifelines construct and you show all the relevant information that might be tied to that particular Lifeline. So you all are doing great work. And um, if I'm correct, Erica, this is all publicly available, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Minus the editable feature, <laughs> but yeah, so uh, really nice work. Um, so while everyone attending may not have a desire and ability to move well-established situational awareness apps, or reports to a structure organized uh, around lifelines in the near future, and that's really okay. We wanna highlight here just some best practices that will facilitate coordination and an ability to report by lifeline by simply categorizing and tagging your data when it is relevant to a lifeline. And I'll show more examples in a minute. So before we get to our next panelist, I wanted to share some resources in addition to those uh, that you've already been presented with already in order to stay as close to an hour as possible and ensure our panelists get ample time, I'm just going to show briefly some screenshots of the resources available and how you can access them and include some additional best practices. And we will continue to add links that you can explore at the same time or later if you choose. So many of you may be aware of FEMA's Preparedness Toolkit, uh, which is a suite of resources and tools that support implementation of a national preparedness system. And we don't have time to go into all the resources available within Prep Toolkit, but it does support exercise and preparedness planners in their workflows, as well as offer a myriad of resources for geospatial practitioners supporting them. And this includes sample maps and apps by Lifeline. Um, and then again, Highfield data provides a significant catalog of static infrastructure data that may support gaps in your local data or provide data needed for a regional view. So for anyone who wants to follow along, feel free to visit the website shown here. I'm really just going to talk to about how you can use one of the pre-configured web maps in Prep Toolkit that are preloaded with a number of data sets that you may not know exist um, and could give you a jump start for building community lifeline focused maps. So when you go to the Prep Toolkit site, you would then select Hazard Explorer, which is shown in step one on the far left. From there, we would access the ready-made templates and the exercise planner resource page shown here in the middle in gray. And on the right is an example of one of the web apps, in this case, the communications lifeline map template. And these give you a description of the lifeline and the types of information that feeds it. And you can simply use this application or open the web map, which is the link that step three is pointing to for more functionality and to save a copy that you can update with your own local data. So shown here are the basic steps I just mentioned. So why, you might, why might you want to start here? Well, for example, the communications template may contain a number of static and dynamic feeds that my jurisdiction doesn't maintain. Additionally, we may have really good local data that can be combined with these data sets. For example, I may have good PSAP point and polygon layer for my community. So I can open up the web map and save a copy. I would then add our PSAP data layers using the URL to that data service which is step two, then if desired, I can update the layer with standardized symbology by grabbing the link to the proper symbol in NAPSIG's symbol library tool, in this case, the symbol for 911 centers, and update it in my web map. Additionally, within FEMA's Preparedness Toolkit is the Hazard Explorer tool, which allows communities to view hazard exposure in relationship to vulnerable populations and the built environment. Infrastructure is grouped in these tabs across the top by lifeline. And this allows planners to understand the potential impacts by community lifeline in developing realistic exercise scenarios. So you do not need to be a GIS analyst or even be technically savvy. The tool guides you through these steps. And in the end, you can export your map or maps for an exercise situation manual or for planning documents. And the last tab uh, is, has links to all the data. So if you do have JS capabilities in-house, then you can use any of the data from the tool, any, any of the data from the tool and use it in your own application. So a few more best practices. Add local data whenever available. Swap out operational live data feeds for base 
static data whenever possible. Display the subcomponents that are impacted with the ability to turn on other data sets to minimize clutter. And use the same stoplight approach for operational status for infrastructure. Whenever developing public safety maps, color should really indicate status and a call to action. And lastly, I want to make the case that you can be capturing impact signaling lifelines via your field teams and mobile forms, similar to what Emily was talking about with the Survey 123 form that they made available to the public. So what you see here is a standardized search and rescue form given used by many states and locals developed by NAPSIC Search and Rescue Working Group with support from the International Association of Fire Chiefs and National Park Service. If you have the Survey123 app, you can access the form in our sandbox to test it out by using the QR code here or following the link added to the chat window. By thinking through what information you might be capturing and how you can best standardize entries, think pre-populated drop, drop, drop downs, et cetera, that data can be easily mined and filtered and you can develop dashboards to specifically show these metrics. For example, blank number of damaged structures uh, or public infrastructure related to transportation. And this can assist you in quickly quantifying damage to assist in disaster declarations and public assistance. So this actually brings us to our next panelist who's been working to build strong regional partnerships and advocating for agreed upon standardized data. So with that, we have Eric Andrelot with us and you have some great examples that I'll let you share with the group. All right, thanks Terry, and uh, thank you to you and, and NAPSIC for the opportunity to, to brief this group. Um, so uh, we just wrapped up the, the Shake and Fury exercise, and I, I thought this would be a good opportunity to go over how community lifelines factored into the information sharing um, that took place at the state and regional level. Uh, and for this, I was working in support of uh, Department of Homeland Security Science and Technology, as well as the Central U.S. Earthquake Consortium, or QSEC. All right, so a little bit first about the exercise. Uh, Shaken Fury was a FEMA-led um, uh, off-year exercise uh, centered around a 7.7 .7 magnitude earthquake uh, just west of Memphis, Tennessee, in the New Madrid seismic zone. Uh, this earthquake-prone region touches eight states and four FEMA regions. So a scenario like this is a really good setting to examine uh, the coordinated response and recovery capabilities at the regional level and involving the whole community, which, which I think we accomplished. Uh, participants in the exercise included uh, emergency management agencies in the QSEC member states, as well as local municipalities, uh, also federal departments and agencies, um, Department of uh, Defense components, uh, private sector, NGOs, and, and various utilities. Next slide. Um, so briefly, the, the main objectives of this exercise, there were nine interagency objectives overall. I'm just showing the first four here, which were really the ones that the QSEC states were focused on. Uh, these four included um, information sharing, adjudication of, of uh, critical resources, uh, field reporting and mutual aid planning and tracking. And, you know, I have to say that the community lifeline construct was really a component of each of these objectives, in particular, the, the information sharing objective. So based on those uh, exercise objectives and the importance of information sharing for this exercise, I thought it'd be appropriate to go over some of the previous efforts within the QSEC region to standardize regional information sharing. And this goes back uh, before the 2011 national level exercise. Um, the, the general approach has been for the QSEC board of directors, um, which is comprised of the emergency management uh, directors in each state, uh, with the input from the QSEC GIS IT working group to establish um, a list of, of core essential elements of information to prioritize uh, regional information sharing efforts. So uh, along this way, um, DHS s and who I support, has been um, providing guidance on publishing and sharing information, as well as standing up some of the technology and solutions uh, to, to better uh, equip the states and region for, uh, for improved information sharing. Uh, as you see on this slide, the EIs have changed to some degree over time, although there are kind of a core set of EIs that have largely remained the same. Um, and in the current set of EEIs, um, you see off to the right here, 
are essentially lined up uh, to the, the community lifelines. And uh, the Shake and Fury exercise was a good opportunity for the states as well as the FEMA regions to test out this lifeline construct. Um, we, we also anticipate that uh, as FEMA evolves this construct, you know, going into this summer, that there will be a, a continued effort by QSEC to continue to refine and, and align the QSEC EEIs to match the construct as, as best as possible. So this slide provides a high-level overview of the QSEC Regional Information Sharing Platform, or the RISP. Uh, this is built on top of ArcGIS Online, and it's essentially designed to bring together QSEC member states and other partners in an effort to better coordinate information sharing across the region. Um, the components of this include um, the ability to deliver information products. Um, so examples of that are uh, things like regional power outage dashboards or communications dashboards, uh, information on, on open and closed status of businesses, as well as information products that the state and local um, organizations part of QSEC are sharing. Um, the RISP also leverages Amazon hosted automation scripts to support data integration, um, kind of ETL or extract, uh, transfer and load type processes. Um, and it also has the capability of providing historical data analysis for things like the trend, looking at the trends of power status over time. So on this slide, I'm, I'm just highlighting um, the QSEC Shaken Fury Hub. Um, this was an ArcGIS Online Hub site that we set up for the exercise there is a mirror version for the QSEC RISP um, that has real-time data. This, the Shake and Fury Hub, of course, was designed to uh, provide access to, to exercise-focused data. Um, and on the right here is a page just highlighting some of the data partners involved. And uh, we've worked with uh, participants in the exercise to provide some tagging recommendations on items that they shared to uh, enable a, a easier way of filtering items by data provider uh, via this site. And, and there are links below um, so you could access either the, the real-time RISP site or the, the Shake and Fury Hub uh, at your leisure. Um, and this here is a overview of the, uh, the Lifeline pages on the, the Shake and Fury Hub. And, and again, the RISP uh, Hub is, is similar. Um, it, this provided a way to bucket information product according to the lifelines. Um, you know, we, we included information shared by QSEC, states, uh, FEMA, and other partners. So this is where, you know, we, we included those, um, the FEMA lifeline dashboards that Sid mentioned, uh, as well as uh, some of the crowdsourcing products that groups like CEDAR were producing during the exercise uh, that, that em Emily mentioned. Um, and on the right here is, is one of the featured pages, pages for the energy uh, lifeline with, with some of those featured applications shown. Um, now, I think importantly, um, you know, the state-driven efforts leading up to the exercise, um, the states work to align some of their existing processes to the lifelines, as well as, you know, evaluating some new processes that would be required to support the lifeline reporting uh, uh, requirements. Um, a key process that that we worked with states on was aligning um, their mission and resource requests, which really provide, I think, um, an important insight on what's currently being done to stabilize lifelines. So this kind of speaks to the now what um, that Martina discussed. You have the, the what, so what, and then the now what. So what are states doing to address um, the, the issues in order to stabilize lifelines? Uh, so examples in this page are of the, the TEMA uh, Mission Command Center dashboard, which shows um, ongoing and requested missions, as well as Kentucky Emergency Management uh, Resource Request Dashboard. Um, and I have to give some credit to Florida Emergency Management, who um, kind of innovated some of these practices around uh, aligning resource uh, requests to lifelines during uh, last year's hurricane season. Um, and it does not look like, let's see, uh, or one of the slides, I guess, did not get in. Um, I, I just wanted to briefly mention, uh, we also worked to, um, uh, with Kentucky Emergency Management on aligning some infrastructure status updates 
um, using Survey123 with the Lifeline uh, capabilities. So this actually tied in um, to the ability to, uh, to provide uh, state and locals with um, a, a really easy to use process for updating infrastructure status. Um, and, and this template could be you know, readily deployed uh, for other purposes as well. Um, it used use static infrastructure layers um, and integrated with Survey123 and then web maps configured with Arcade scripts uh, to you know, build a historical tracking capability around, around those status changes. Um, so I've got a link here to the Shaken Fury 2019 story map. Um, please take a look. It gives you some more uh, context for some of what uh, QSEC and, and the states uh, were able to pull off during Shaken Fury. Um, so thanks. I think that covers my section. Great. Thanks so much, Eric. And I will mention that, uh, so I'm sorry, one of your slides was probably just hidden. And uh, in fact, all of our panelists had lots of really good information they wanted to share with you, but we just couldn't do it all in an hour. So when we publish the materials to the website, the full presentations that everyone um, provide will be there. So any, uh, the slide that was missing that you just spoke to will be included in that. Um, and what I think is really impressive, and it speaks to the dedication and commitment of the states and locals that were working um, in the QSEC region, working together to uh, agree on these standards. Um, so uh, to, continue, to continue on, I know we're running close on time. Um, uh, I wanted to uh, next turn it over to Eric Shreve, just kind of going through our levels of government here. Eric is with the state of Arizona. Um, we see your work all the time. You do a lot of really great things and really conscientious with putting out just informative apps to the public. And I know your division of emergency management is really mature in its geospatial integration. And we thought it would be great to kind of wrap up our panelist segment with you since we know uh, uh, you are looking to kind of transition to the community lifelines construct. So I'll let you take it away. So thanks, Terry. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Eric Shree with the Arizona Department of Emergency and Military Affairs. Um, for folks that were at the ESRI User Conference, uh, we did a presentation at the National Public Safety Security Summit um, referencing our dashboard, and that's kind of what I'm briefly going to talk about in the presentation. So basically, our Arizona ESF RSF operations dashboard, it reflects a emergency support function centric approach where we have the ESFs broken down through a story map and each individual dashboard that represents, um, you know, what the current situation is for each ESF. And having this solution uh, basically helps us streamline information sharing so you don't get that um, you know, information overload when you look at a map or a visual when you come into the EOC. Um, and everything's based off our Arizona State Emergency Response and Recovery Plan. So when it's a bad day, we reference that playbook essentially to give us um, our operational information. So the board that we reference, we're big web EOC users here at the state of Arizona, and we have it uh, distributed throughout our counties in the state and that goes down to the locals and having that infrastructure or that I guess footprint already laid out gives us that capability for seamless information sharing coming from the state going down to the locals. The big the board that I'm going to reference very briefly is the county infrastructure status board and we reference that for our ESF 5 emergency management operations dashboard on the GIS side. And essentially what you see here in the screenshot is the EEI that was referenced earlier in the presentations about um, all this, you know, critical infrastructure that's occurring across the state and giving the counties the ability to report their information to say what their current status is using the red or uh, the stoplight approach. So green obviously is good and then red is bad. Using that kind of gives us a better comprehensive visual um, of reporting information. But the thought process moving forward is changing our ESF slash um, infrastructure reporting to more of a lifeline based approach working from Web EOC over to uh, GIS. So the example screenshot you see here is our current setup that references all the counties in our state giving the columns going from left to right referencing things like electricity, uh, roads, bridges, things of that nature, and giving 
this tool, um, the capability for the counties to report with their information in, and having that cross over um, into a GIS-based product gives us a better a visual representation. So you can see here, um, great source of information when you come into an ESC as far as reporting, but we thought rather than just having a visual that we see here um, of tabular data, why not make it map-based? So the example here, using the WebEOC ArcGIS Online connector, we were able to plug in data essentially from that board that you saw in the previous slide and carry it over into a uh, operations dashboard uh, that gives kind of that rapid situational awareness um, visual to show what currently is going on. Um, having this uh, tool basically has given us a great way to brief uh, executive leadership as well as the governor's office about the current state snapshot. Um, luckily in Arizona, we don't have a lot of regional based events or statewide events. They're more um, localized either at the county or local level. So we haven't had an opportunity to really uh, harness this, this uh, idea and concept into reality. But obviously the thought process going forward is changing the ESF concept to lifelines and look forward to hearing more and sharing what we are able to produce on our end. So, Terry, I think that's it on my end. Awesome. And uh, I actually want to thank you again for juggling real world events and joining us for this session. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, your work. <laughs> and I, I, it was, a, I know it's a challenging time, and I appreciate you uh, doing that. Um, so I just want to say, uh, uh, oh, sorry, um, that I thought wrapping up with you made a lot of sense. I think a lot of where, your position, where you are in moving towards an ESF, the community lifeline, I think a lot of folks can relate to that. And so, so where, where do you start now? You've gotten to see some really great presentations um, and learned a little bit more about the community lifelines construct. Um, so as Jessica mentioned, the Community Lifeline Toolkit 2.0 will be coming out soon, mid to late August. So keep an eye out for that and take advantage of the resources that they provide to work with your, part, your partner agencies and get them informed. Identify static and dynamic data sources that support the lifelines in your community. We showed you web maps that have a lot of national static and dynamic data preloaded. Within the Hazard Explorer site are resources for discovering local data as well. Prioritize the development of partnerships where gaps in data exist. Determine which of the components above are the most critical and identify data owners and work with them to get it in a consumable format. Identify how status information is and will be updated. So Region 6 published an editable data layer. So the technology is there, but the people and processes are what need to be in place. And additionally, how can you work with your neighboring jurisdictions to populate status to a regional view? Lastly, uh, be on the lookout for materials from this session today. We'll be posting the recording along with the full slide deck. It uh, includes all the, the additional slides and resources that our panelists really wanted to leave you with that we just couldn't fit into an hour. Um, so just to be aware of some events uh, that are coming up, our next Prep Tech Talk installment is happening August 29th. It's Get Smart on Information Standards for Crisis Management. Uh, you might uh, detect a pattern here. Secondly, our annual summit, INSPIRE, formerly known as NGPS, will be held in November in Gallatin, Texas. This is a free event, and we highly encourage you to attend with a team from your organization, a leader, an operator, a technologist. Materials from last year's summit is available on our website if you would like to check those out. So, um, and continue to check back to our events page for new happenings. You can also access materials from previous events, uh, like last year's summit, in, in this location as well. So we're slightly over by just a couple of minutes. Um, if our panelists can stay on, we'll maybe take a question or two. I don't want to go over too far. I want to um, understand or respect everyone's time. Charlotte, did you have uh, anything that you wanted uh, that we needed to touch on before we let anybody go? We do have one question that came in, if we can answer that. So the question was, are there efforts to explore how to identify the interdependencies between the lifelines by combining some lifeline data feeds into one map or dashboard? That is an awesome question. <laughs> I think a lot of folks, um, a lot of the panelists could take a stab. Um, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus to <laughs> answer first, but I know uh, Sid, your group is working on 
um, along with Esri, I believe, to figure out how that could be, how they can develop dashboards where um, lifeline impacts in one could be uh, shown, visualized, and analyzed in another dashboard. Is that right? Yeah, Terry, I was, I was just going to say, um, so it's not, um, it's not a MDWG-led uh, effort, but, but there is a team um, at FEMA right now that's working with, with Esri and, and others to, to figure out how that can be done. Awesome. So, and, you know, maybe this, is, you know, as that kind of gets worked through, it's something that, you know, would be a topic and, you know, at a future MDWG meeting or something that NASA can kind of uh, socialize to give folks, you know, an understanding of what that might look like. Did any other panelists have any final thoughts or um, want to also make an answer to that question? I think we're good. Awesome. Well, I think 205 is pretty good. I appreciate everyone's time today. Thank you again to our panelists and our attendees. Um, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Look for materials from today's session on our website very soon. Thank you.